we, we were aggressive in we would shoot the 20 millimeter cannon, we would scrape the escarpment with 50 caliber thing. Everything we had, we shot the rockets off at the enemy. Mm -hmm. Nobody was to be seen. You don't know what you hit. Right. And you couldn't see death coming at you. Everything was invisible. All you see was planes flying over, the ships over here, everywhere. In Iraq, we were building uh, wooden structures for the army, basically. Definitely, we were shot at. It was mostly indirect fire, like rockets or mortars. We would wake up to a lot of explosions. Um, and I, I made it through just fine. We went out on patrol. We would either be trucked to some area or helicoptered in and jump out, and we'd be out in the, in the patrol. At that time, we were, the, all the missions were called search and destroy. That means they could ambush you at any time because you were looking for trouble, you know? <laughs> you know, you were just not sitting around waiting for it to come to you. You were actually a actively engaged in trying to find it. On the front lines, the Military Veterans of the Art Students League features the work of 20 prominent artists who either taught or studied at the Art Students League, plus the work of 40 contemporary veteran artists. In the late 1940s, artists such as Robert Rauschenberg, Paul Jenkins, and Alfred Leslie come to the Art Students League and they really begin developing their own styles in response to abstract expressionism, which is the major movement at this time in the New York art world. And they are studying here with um, Morris Cantor. His class is sort of a focal point for many of these artists uh, to begin to develop their own abstract styles. Jenkins begins to sort of pour this very liquid, uh, fluid paint across the surfaces of the canvas and this is an experimental moment for him, uh, studying with Cantor. In the early 40s, uh, after the outbreak of the war, the League's registration uh, declined severely. We would not have been able to, to sustain the, our, our program if it hadn't been for the thousands of GIs that studied here. Well, when we look at the history of art, at any moment when we have a moment of great creativity, there is some kind of substantial patronage behind that, whether it's the commercial art market or um, an individual patron, or in the 1930s, uh, the New Deal government steps in with the WPA and becomes a substantial patron. So as we come up uh, into the late 1940s, the GI Bill sort of steps into that role, uh, providing uh, tuition credits uh, for up to $500. And this has a huge impact for um, all students, but in particular for the artists, this uh, allows them to devote themselves to artistic study full time. The GI Bill was looking to train the uh, veterans who came back from the war for a career. So we started offering a lot of uh, more commercial classes. We were teaching fashion design at the same time, calligraphy, other classes of a more commercial nature. An illustration was a very popular uh, program. Frank Riley was the most well-known uh, illustration instructor and, and literally thousands of people uh, were packed into that class. After the war, it was a miracle. All the plates were studded everywhere. There were hundreds and hundreds of GIs in the Art Students League. Amazing conversation. And the rap that occurred between the GIs in the lunchroom or whatever, in between class or what have you, and making friends, and the exchanges about art and what it was all about. It was a camaraderie, and out of that developed lifelong friends or acquaintances that, that, that are still kicking. I've, I've, I've gotten calls, are you still around? Yeah, <laughs> League. Uh, yeah. Rauschenberg came in from Paris, he was, uh, he was at the Sorbonne, 
and he came into class and immediately attached himself to me, and we were close visitors, Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and Cy Twomley, the whole group with Rauschenberg, and he brought them in. After World War II, two-thirds of our student population were, were vets. By the time Vietnam uh, came around, that population had, had lowered to about 10%. Getting out of the service, um, I remember standing on the corner of 50th Street and 9th Avenue, where I grew up, and I remember looking around and saying, nothing has changed, but why do I feel so different? You know, when I got here, the familiarity, I mean, the, the, I don't know what it is, I, I, maybe it's one of our senses, the smell of turpentine. The smell of turpentine was like perfume, and the leap just made you feel comfortable. And I could draw or paint or sculpt, you know, and, and everyone was in some way positive. At the same time, all the institutions that had the GI Bill were being reviewed and recertified. And as more accredited institutions began uh, having art programs, the non-accredited institutions began coming under greater scrutiny uh, by the government. It happened during the summer of 1973. There were 90 uh, Vietnam veterans at that time <coughs> attending the league. And um, we were informed uh, that we could no longer attend under the GI Bill. In the early 1970s, the Art Students League wasn't in the practice of tracking attendance, and we've never offered formal grading for our classes. And this was a problem uh, in relationship to the GI Bill because the state uh, required those sort of formal measures in order to enable enrollment. We were kind of flabbergasted, we didn't know what to do. There was 90 of us and we all got together and we talked about it and some guys wanted to close up Broadway. I mean, you know, some of these guys were, you know, hardcore Vietnam veterans and, you know, do anything to, to make something happen. We started to get some notice and we had a show at Lincoln Center and we were written up in the New York Times and it was just a, our call was, we fought for freedom and now can't choose. That's, that was our banner. After weeks of uh, demonstrating, Stuart Clonus, the, the executive director of the league, gets a call from Nelson Rockefeller that um, he has a piece of sculpture that needs to be repaired. And in the conversation about finding someone to repair this piece of sculpture, he says, by the way, your veterans can attend. And that was, that was it. This was a pivotal moment in our history because it allows us to keep the GI Bill and to enable veterans to continue to study at the Art Students League. I pieced together this idea that I, I have the GI Bill and I know that I can use it to study art, but where can I do it? It was just a matter of getting, getting organized, figuring out what it would take to move to New York. It was a big headache coming here, but I mean, there's no other, as you know, there's no other place like it here in the States. I do sometimes look back to that period in my life and wish that I could go back there knowing what I know now, you know, because in Iraq, I would sketch like whatever's on my desk, um, a bagel or a cup of tea or, you know, nonsense things. I just wanted to get my mind off of where I was. I guess that's what I mean. I wish I could go back having the skills now because I was seeing something and recognizing something that was worth drawing. And uh, now I'm able to get closer to, to getting it. Before it was just uh, fumbling, but I could still see what it was. And now I get even closer. And tomorrow I'll get closer. And... 
Surprisingly, the effect of the GI Bill on American art is not something that has received uh, substantial consideration. This exhibition on the front lines is really an initial uh, effort to draw attention to the topic and hopefully to spur further investigation into the subject. And I think in the veterans' stories, we can really see sort of a link between past and present. The artists that come today are coming with the same goals, the same ambitions to really devote themselves to artistic practice. And to offer this opportunity is something that is central to the League's mission, to offer the opportunity to anyone, regardless of their background, who is devoted to pursuing a serious career in art.